This is the Ford Theater, a full hour of radio drama. Our play today, the highly unusual murder mystery, Laura. The Ford Theater, presented by the Ford Motor Company, makers of Ford, Mercury, and Lincoln cars, and Ford trucks, farm tractors, and industrial engines. In the past three generations, millions of Americans have learned to rely on Ford products. For three generations, Ford has led the way in the development of more dependable, more economical transportation. Today, in the third generation, more than eight million Americans prefer Ford products. They know from experience, you can depend on Ford. As spokesman for the Ford Theater, may we present the distinguished playwright, producer, and actor co-author of Life with Father and the forthcoming production Life with Mother, Mr. Howard Lindsay. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. A few years ago, 1944 to be exact, patrons of the motion picture were delighted and surprised to see a new kind of mystery thriller. It kept them on the edge of their seats, of course, but also... It tugged at their heartstrings with a most unexpected romance. That motion picture was Laura, made from Vera Caspary's distinguished novel. This afternoon, we have tried to recapture all the special ingredients of both the book and the movie in Howard Teichman's radio adaptation of Laura. As the great curtain of the Ford Theater rises, there is disclosed an office in the Homicide Bureau. Let us listen as Lieutenant of Detectives Mark McPherson reads a report he has just finished writing. May 30th, 1948. Subject, official report on the murder of Laura Hunt. Officer in charge, Mark McPherson, Lieutenant Homicide Bureau, Police Department, New York City. Details as follows. On the morning of May 22nd, 1948, Miss Laura Hunt had been murdered by person or persons unknown in her apartment at 741 Sutton Place. Suspects known at the time included Mrs. Ann Treadwell, aunt of the deceased, Mr. Shelby Carpenter, employee in deceased's advertising agency, also engaged to marry her, and Mr. Waldo Leidecker, friend. Waldo Leidecker, man about town, drama critic, columnist, wit. Middle-aged, educated, rich. I called on him first. Leidecker was sitting in the tub in the fanciest gadget-filled bathroom I'd ever seen. Come in, Lieutenant McPherson. Nice little place you have here. It's lavish, but I call it home. I suppose you hear about the Laura Hunt murder. That's right. Do you mind if I read a statement? Be a good fellow and hand me that paper there, will you? You see, after Laura's body was found, I was questioned by Sergeant Schultz and McCavity, and I stated, On Friday night, Laura had a dinner engagement with me, after which she was ostensibly going out of town. She phoned and cancelled our engagement at exactly seven o'clock. Why'd you write it down? Afraid you'd forget? I am one of the most widely misquoted men in America. When my friends do it, I resent it. From Sergeant Schultz and McCavity, I should find it intolerable. Now, hand me that washcloth, please, Bill. Have you any more questions? Just one, Mr. Leidecker. Two years ago, in your May 15th column, you started writing a book review, but at the bottom of the column, you switched over to the Harrington murder case. Are the processes of the creative mind now under the jurisdiction of the police? You said Harrington was wiped out with a shotgun loaded with buckshot, the way Laura Hunt was murdered night before last. Did I? Yeah. But he was really killed with a sash weight. How ordinary. My version was obviously superior. I never bother with details, you know. I do. Well, so long. Where are you going from here? I'm going to drop in on Miss Hunt's aunt, then I might watch the Yankees play Philadelphia. Are you solving this case from the bleachers? You seem to forget that a murder has been committed. That's something you get pretty used to on the homicide But I dare say this murder is a little different from your ordinary run of cases. The only thing different about it is the address. Sutton Place and Park Avenue instead of Delancey Street or Flatbush. 
Outside of that, some two-time and dame gets murdered in her flat practically every day. Dame? How dare you call Laura a dame? What would you call her? She was young, beautiful. She was distinguished. A woman of character, a lady. A lady who gets knocked off generally turns out to be a dame. Is that one of your better generalizations? No, I was quoting from one of your columns. Ah, that's the second time you've mentioned my column. Do you mind if I go along with you, McPherson? What for? Murder is my favorite crime. I write about it regularly. And I know you'll have to visit everyone on your list of suspects. I'd like to study their reactions. You're on the list yourself, you know. Good. To have overlooked me would have been a pointed insult. You're not the sort of man one would insult, Mr. Leidecker. Do you really suspect me? Were you in love with Laura Hunt? Was she in love with you, Mr. Leidecker? She considered me the wisest, the wittiest, the most interesting man she had ever met. I was in complete accord with her on that point. She thought me also the kindest, the gentlest, the most sympathetic man in the world. Did you agree with her there, too? McPherson, you won't understand this. But I tried to become the kindest, the gentlest, the most sympathetic man in the world. Have any luck? Let me put it this way. I should be sincerely sorry to see my neighbor's children devoured by wolves. And now, if you'll help me out of this tub, I'll be ready to join you in a moment. <laughs> Mrs. Anne Treadwell. Also middle-aged, also rich, also a suspect. Leidecker and I found her at home in her Park Avenue duplex. Lieutenant McPherson has just taken over the case, Anne. Be careful of what you tell him. He's a demon. Really, Waldo? I've got all the reports, Mrs. Treadwell, but I have a few more questions. Certainly. I'll do anything I can to help, Lieutenant. You were fond of your niece, Mrs. Treadwell? I adored her. I can understand your collapsing when you identified the body. Oh, it was horrible. A shotgun full of BBs, it's not nice to look at. Her mate, Bessie, I suppose she was devoted to Miss Hunt. Oh, she adored her. Laura had her for years. I'll never forget her scream when she saw poor Laura lying there. Did Miss Hunt have any enemies that you know of, Mrs. Treadwell? I'm sure she hadn't. Everybody adored her. Naturally, some women didn't quite understand why men found her so attractive. But she was... I'm quite sure she never hurt anyone deliberately. Poor darling. Did you approve of Laura's coming marriage to Mr. Carpenter? Why shouldn't I approve? I don't know. You were fond of Mr. Carpenter? Why, of course. In love with him? But... <laughs> this is beginning to assume fabulous aspects. What are you driving at, <laughs> Mr. McPherson? The truth, Mrs. Treadwell. Were you in love with him? Why, no. I'm very fond of Mr. Carpenter, of course. Everybody is. I'm not. I'll be hanged if I am. Really, Waldo? Mrs. Treadwell, for some time you've been withdrawing various amounts in cash. Sometimes 1500 and 1700 at a clip. Why, yes, I uh, needed that money. The day you took out $1,500, Mr. Carpenter deposited it 1350 When you withdrew 1700 he deposited it 1550 Maybe they were shooting uh, crap. Must I be insulted by Mr. Lydica, Lieutenant? I'm sorry, Mrs. Treadwell, but I have to find out about these things. I understand. Well, Shelby needed the money, and I uh, lent it to him. After all, it's my money, and I can do it. Hello, Lydica. Well, we were just talking about you, Shelby. Shelby Carpenter. The third suspect was too handsome to be good-looking. He was tall, he was smooth, he was a phony if I ever saw one. I hadn't expected to find him at Ann Treadwell's. Shelby, this is Lieutenant McPherson. How do you do, Lieutenant? I didn't know you were here, Mr. Carpenter. I was lying down. I've hardly slept since... Is that a sign of guilt or innocence, McPherson? Lieutenant, I'm as eager to find the murderer as you are. But what possible motive could I have for killing Laura? Miss Hunt and I were going to be married this week, you know. No, he doesn't know, and neither do I or you or anyone else alive. What do you mean by that, Leidecker? Laura had not definitely made up her mind to marry him. She told me so herself Friday afternoon when she called up to cancel our dinner engagement... As a matter of fact, she was going to the country to uh, think it over. I, um, I want you to know, Lieutenant, I own some shotguns myself. How many? Two or three. Two or three? Well, two. Where are they? In storage at O'Rourke's warehouse. Well, this is becoming too simple. Really, McPherson. If you don't watch him, he'll confess before you get started. <laughs> I 
I asked Shelby if he had a key to Miss Hunt's house in the country. He said he thought there was one at her flat, so we went there. It was an eerie place, beautifully furnished, but the minute I walked in, something hit me. I couldn't put my finger on it. The first thing I saw was a grandfather's clock. Exactly like the one I'd seen in Waldo Lydecker's apartment. And then I saw the spots in the rug. What's that you're looking at, McPherson? The body lay there. I thought you weren't up here before. I saw the police photos. I'd better find that key, Lieutenant. Why did she have to be photographed in that horrible condition? Uh, When a dame gets killed, she doesn't worry about how she looks. Why don't you stop calling her a dame? Look around. Is this the home of a dame? Look at that portrait of her. Not bad, Mr. Lydecker. Not bad? McPherson, do you have any appreciation of authentic beauty? Obviously not. Therefore, let me instruct you. Look at that portrait. The lights in Laura's hair. The exquisitely perfect bone structure of her face. The piquant tilt of her nose. The haunting quality of her eyes. Yeah, she was okay. Yes. Mm Mm-hmm. Jacoby was in love with her when he painted it. But it lacks her vibrance, her warmth. Have you ever been in love? A doll in Washington Heights once got a fox fur out of me. Ever know a woman who wasn't a doll or a dame? Yeah, one. She kept walking me past furniture stores to look at the living room suites. Oh, Carpenter. Yeah? Why did Laura want to go away this weekend? For a rest. And she had a new advertising campaign to work out. Yeah? Just before the wedding? Isn't that kind of unusual? No. She went up to her place in Connecticut every weekend. Found that key yet? Not yet, It may be in this drawer. She usually... Here it is. I knew I'd seen it around. Yeah? The police are very fussy about their inventories. The key isn't on the list of things that were in that drawer yesterday, Carpenter. Then it's made a recent reappearance. You put it there, didn't you, Carpenter? Well, I... It's only that I didn't want to give it to you while Waldo was present. I have private reasons that don't concern him. Everything about Laura concerns me, perhaps more than you. You have private reasons to lie about this key, no doubt. For your own good, Waldo, I'm warning you to stop implying that I had anything to do with Laura's death. That night, Waldo Lydecker took me to dinner and poured his heart out. He told me how he and Laura happened to meet, how he helped her with her work, how he chose her clothes, her friends... How he guided her and watched her become one of the most successful career women in New York. He told me how he tried to protect her from a leech named Shelby Carpenter. But for the first time in their entire relationship, Laura refused his advice. She gave Shelby Carpenter a job in her advertising agency, put him on his feet. And when Waldo proved to her that Carpenter was two-timing her with some little model from the agency named Diane Redfern, Laura forgave him. It wasn't easy for Waldo Lydecker to tell me those things. I never thought that he could care about anybody but himself. When he talked about Laura, you felt a heart went with that stick and that carnation. The next day, I went over to Laura's apartment and poked around. I found a bottle of scotch, and I had an idea it might mean something. Who are you? Bessie Clary, Miss Hunt's maid. Hello, Miss Clary. Do you happen to know how this bottle of black pony scotch got in her liquor cabinet? I put it there. But she never bought this stuff, Bessie. Not a lady like Miss Hunt. No. When did you put it in the cabinet? Saturday. Before the police came. Was it here Friday night when you left? No. Sure of that? I cleaned out the cabinet before I left Friday and put the empties in the basement. And somebody was in the apartment with her Friday night. Someone who brought this bottle. Who? I don't know. But I didn't want anybody getting any wrong ideas about her. God rest her soul. All right, take it easy, Bessie. We'll have a drink of this stuff. I got the glasses. You get the ice, will you? All right. Now, I'll get it. Good morning, Lieutenant McPherson. Hello, McPherson. Well, quite a delegation. Mrs. Treadwell, Mr. Lydecker, Mr. Carpenter. It was you I wanted to see, Carpenter. Well, Shelby's dropping me off the hairdressers later, so I thought I might as well come along. My excuse is equally feeble. I just popped in to pay my dubious respects and inquire on the state of your health, McPherson. Insipid, I trust. I was just about to pour myself a drink. Black Pony Scotch. It's cheap, but it's potent. 
Care to join me, Carpenter? Uh, as a matter of fact, I don't think I care for anything. I'm not much of a daytime drinker. I, uh, I remember when Laura bought these glasses. She loved them. She loved all her things, so... What are you planning to do, Anne? Sell them? Oh, I don't know. I suppose I'll have to dispose of everything. Not quite everything, Anne. Two or three things in here belong to me. There's that vase, for instance, and the fire screen, and, of course, the clock and the vestibule. I only lent them to Laura, you know. Well, really, Waldo? Yes, really. That vase is the gem of my collection, and I intend to have it back in the screen and the clock, too. They aren't yours. You gave them to Laura. You I won't permit it. McPherson doesn't alleged fiancé have any voice in this matter. I'll take the vase with me now and send someone to collect the other things this very day. Nothing is leaving here except you, Lydecker. Is that your quaint way of indicating dismissal? We're all going anyway. Well, didn't you want to see me, McPherson? Don't worry, Carpenter. I'll be seeing you. That night I locked myself in Laura's apartment and went over it with a fine-tooth comb. Curiously enough, I found myself looking at her shoes, her hats, touching her dresses, even smelling her perfume. I began to feel as if I knew her. I did know her. From her diary, letters, date pads, canceled checks, notes she'd made on all sorts of things. I knew things about her, attitudes she had, that none of her friends knew. But there was something missing. I wanted to hear her laugh and maybe cry, too. For half an hour, I stared at the painting of her. Lydecker was right. She was the most beautiful woman I'd ever seen. She was fascinating, warm and soft and human. If she'd been alive, I... I had to stop thinking of her as if she were a date for the night. She'd been murdered, and I had to get the guy who did it. I had to force myself to remember it was just another job. Then the doorbell rang, and Lidecker came in. I happen to see the light on, McPherson. Have you sublet this apartment? You're here often enough to pay rent. Any objection? Only one. I object to your prying into Laura's letters, especially those from me. Why? Yours are the best in the bunch. Thank you, but I didn't write them to you. Haven't you any sense of privacy? Murder victims have no claim to privacy. You don't have to do this. You're just prying. Strictly routine. Is buying that portrait strictly routine? Corey, the art dealer, told me you've already put in a bid for it. That's none of your business, Lydecker. Have detectives who buy portraits of murder victims a claim to privacy? McPherson, did it ever strike you that you're acting very strangely? It's a wonder you don't come here like a suitor with roses and a box of candy. Drugstore candy, of course. Maybe she'd have liked it. Have you ever dreamed of Laura as your wife? By your side at the policeman's ball or in the bleachers? Or listening to the heroic story of how you got a silver shin bone from a gun battle with a gangster? <laughs> I see you have. Why don't you go home? I'm busy. Oh, perhaps we can come to terms. You want the portrait? Perfectly understandable. And I want my possessions, my voice, my screen, my clock, also perfectly understandable. Now then, if you... Get can... going. You'd better take care, McPherson, or you'll end up in a psychiatric ward. I don't think they've ever had a patient who fell in love with a corpse. <laughs> I hated his guts. I'd have liked to have seen him burn in the chair. Nobody had hurt me like that since I was a kid. But then nobody had ever hit me like Laura. I sat there waiting. Waiting for what? I don't know. The room, the rain, the silence were alive with her. And her ghost wouldn't let me go. It was after ten. I began to fall asleep or pass out. the sound of the door closing. I looked up and saw, or thought I saw, a woman standing in the doorway. She was holding her hat in her hand and wearing a raincoat. It was dripping wet. The room was dark. My head was a little foggy. 
The woman looked at me and then took one step into the room. What are you doing here? I blinked my eyes. It was Laura. First act curtain falls on a vision of loveliness, hat in hand and wearing a dripping raincoat. The reincarnation, or so it seemed to our highly susceptible detective, of the beautiful woman under whose portrait he had been dozing. Since Laura has now appeared and spoken, we take this belated opportunity of introducing Virginia Gilmore, who is playing the name part in our play. Miss Gilmore is well known as the star of many Broadway plays and motion pictures, the latest of which is Close Up. Let me suggest, however, that for the moment we leave the realm of conjecture and turn to the realm of fact, represented as usual by our good friend Kenneth Fangart. If you're like most people, you're at least a little curious about the new Ford. And that's only natural, because for three generations, ever since the beginning of this century... Americans have been deeply interested in the next move of the Ford Motor Company. The next motor car development as embodied in Ford's famous line of cars. And Americans have been interested for a very good reason. They've learned from experience that Ford has been first with many innovations, the leader in bringing important motor car advancements to its field. So the news that Ford is building an entirely new car arouses nationwide interest immediately. And when people hear that the new Ford is going to be a greater change from the Fords of today than the famous Model A was from the famous Model T, they know that the coming Ford car is going to be another big step ahead. Very soon now, the new Ford will be on display in your Ford dealer showroom. In June, you'll see the Ford 49er. A little later today, I'll give you a preview of some of the details of the 49 Ford. For the moment... I'll just report that it's been planned, styled, and built to be a dream car. The car of the year. Perhaps you've seen the billboards which say, The 49 Ford will knock your hat off. In just a few more days now, in June, you'll see the car of the year. The 49 Ford. The second act of Laura will be heard after a brief pause for station identification. of the Ford Theater's presentation of Laura. And we must return immediately to the drowsy detective, Mark McPherson, and the insubstantial figure of Laura standing in the open doorway of her own apartment. I could hardly keep my hands off her. At the moment, it didn't matter to me at all who was killed or who killed her. I was so relieved, so happy that it wasn't Laura who was dead that I couldn't say a word. What are you doing here? You're alive. If you don't get out at once, I'll, I'll call the police. You are Laura Hunt, aren't you? I, aren't you? I'm going to call the police. I am the police, Mark McPherson. Are you all right? Yes. What, what's this all about? Well, don't you know? Didn't you? Haven't you seen the papers? Don't you know what's happened? No. Where have you been? Up in the country. I, I don't get a paper. No? Haven't you got a radio? It was broken. What? Somebody was murdered in this room. Any idea who it was? No. Who had a key to your apartment? Nobody. Sure? Yes. When did it happen? Friday night. What are you going to do now? Find out who was murdered and find the murderer. Well, you better get those wet clothes off. You'll catch cold. Yes, you're, you're right. If you'll wait here. Officer McPherson. Lieutenant. Would you come here, please? 
In the bedroom. Well? This is Diane Redfern's dress. I found it in my closet. Keep talking. And this is her purse. They weren't here when I left. What else? She was one of our models, just about my size. Do you... Do you suppose... Sit down, she... please, Miss Hunt. This is Monday night. You left Friday. Rather a long weekend, isn't it? Not necessarily. There's no rule about weekends, you know. What train did you take? 726. See anybody you knew on the train? No. And then what? I got off at Norwalk. Saw nobody you knew at the station either? No. Go on. Went to the garage where I keep my car. It's a private garage. Nobody saw me there either. Then I drove to my house. You were there four days. What did you do? Worked in my garden. Didn't you go out in all that time? No, I had everything I needed in the house. I went there to be alone. Nobody came to see you? No. You were going to marry Shelby Carpenter this week. Thursday, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Yet you went away just before your wedding for a long weekend to be alone. Well, I... I was tired. I've been working very hard. You know Shelby has a key to this apartment. Why didn't you tell me? I know nothing of the sort. He hasn't. How else could the girl have got into the apartment? My advance work shows that she was in love with Shelby. That he had given her your cigarette case. You know all that, too, don't you? I knew that she was in love with him. She told me so herself. When did she tell you? At lunch last Friday. I also know that she meant nothing to Shelby. I understand him better than you do. She was found in your dressing gown and slippers. That's not the regulation costume for an impersonal chat between a man and a woman who don't mean anything to each other. Did you know, did you suspect that he'd bring her here Friday night, Miss Hunt? How could I? I don't know that he brought her here, neither do you. You, you merely assume it. What other assumption is possible? Do you love this fellow Carpenter so much that you'd risk your own safety to protect him? My, my safety? Are you suspecting me? I suspect nobody. And everybody. I'm trying to get at the truth. I see from my papers on the desk that you have been trying to get at the truth. You've read things that I never meant anyone to look at. You know how I feel about things and people. It makes a sort of intimacy between us, doesn't it? And yet I, I hardly know you. Yes, you hardly know me. Well, I'd better be going. I'll have to ask you not to leave the house and not to use the phone. But I've got to let people know I'm alive. I'll have to insist that you do as I say. Am I under arrest? No. But if anything happened to you this time, I wouldn't like it. All right. I promise. Okay. Oh, one more thing. You went away to make up your mind about marrying Carpenter. What did you decide? I want the truth. I decided not to marry him. I'll see you in the morning. Good night. Good night. When I walked out of her apartment, I could have sworn she was the finest, most honest dame I'd ever met. And I was floating on air because she decided not to marry that lug carpenter. Hmm. Funny how dames are always pulling a switch on you. When I walked into headquarters, the guys who were tapping Laura's phone told me that she'd just made a date to meet Carpenter in front of his hotel. I went over there and kept an eye on them. Nothing happened. They just talked for a few minutes. Then he got into a car and drove away. I tailed him myself. He led me out to Laura's place in the country. When I walked in on him, he was holding a shotgun. I pulled it out of his hands and looked at it. Are you taking it down or putting it away, Carpenter? Ah, it's been fired lately. I killed some rabbits with it. When? Oh, a while back. I don't know exactly, Lieutenant. You know about guns, don't you? Yes. How come you didn't clean it afterward? I don't know. I forgot, I suppose. Are these your initials on the gun? Yes. I gave it to Laura for protection. You realize the spot you're in, Carpenter? You took that poor girl to Miss Hunt's apartment. You knew all along it was she who was murdered. Didn't you know Laura would come back any day and spill the whole thing? Or did you plan to kill her, too? Hide her body somewhere and cover up the first crime? You're being fantastic, McPherson. You brought a bottle of Black Pony to her house Friday night. I brought a bottle there over a week ago. Bessie says it wasn't there Friday night. It was Saturday morning. I can't help what Bessie says. Where's the key to the apartment? I haven't got it. What'd you do with it? Give it back to her tonight? I never had one. Okay, you didn't bring the scotch Friday night and you didn't have a key to her apartment. How'd you get in? But I... You had a key and I know it. 
Come on, Carpenter, spill it. I... Well, Laura had a duplicate key in her office. I went over and got it. I'd asked Diane to dine with me. I wanted to have it out with her once and for all. You know, she thought... She thought she was in love with me. Well, we couldn't go on talking in a public place. She was too upset. So we went to Laura's. We talked for three hours. Then the doorbell rang and... Go on. I asked Diane to answer the door. Why didn't you go yourself? Suppose one of Laura's friends had found me there. Why open it at all? Because they must have seen the light. But what about the girl, Diane? What about her reputation? I asked her to say that Laura had lent the apartment to her while she was away. Anybody who knew Laura would believe that. Go on. The bell rang again. I heard Diane's mules, Laura's mules they were, clattering on the bare boards between the rugs. Then there was a moment of silence. Then a shot. It was an awful explosion. By the time I reached her, the door was closed and she lay there on the floor. Didn't you go out to see who it was? No, I was too confused, too horrified, incapable of doing anything. My first instinct was to call the police. Why didn't you? I don't know. Or rather, uh, I was afraid, not only for myself, but for Laura. In a panicky sort of way, I felt that I must keep out of this to keep Laura out of it. Did you think Laura had done it? Uh, I don't remember what I thought. Do you think so now? Uh, I don't remember what I thought. Do you think so now? No. But you didn't? No. On Saturday, when our men came to the hotel to tell you that Laura was dead, you seemed sincerely shocked. I was. I had not expected that mistake. But you had your alibi ready, no matter who was dead. Yet you knew the minute Laura came back, it wouldn't stick. I was incapable of thinking that far ahead. Let's get back to the present. What did you and Laura talk about tonight? What? I told her the whole story. Just what I told you. She phoned you after she promised me she wouldn't call anybody. What did she want? It's perfectly natural she'd want to see me, especially after what's happened. Why don't you tell me the truth? She sent you up here to get rid of that gun. She didn't. She doesn't even know I'm here. It was my own idea. Good evening, everyone. And the headlines... Why are you turning on that radio, McPherson? ...for Palestine now centers around the... Works fine, doesn't it? Hmm. Yes. You think it wouldn't? For Laura's sake, I hoped it wouldn't. Morning, Miss Hunt. Good morning. What's in the bag? Breakfast. You didn't buy any food when you went out last night. Where are the pots and pans? I'll fix the bacon and eggs. Can you make coffee? Suppose you set the table while I get breakfast. Do you always sound like this in the morning, Lieutenant McPherson? Don't tell me you can cook. <laughs> my mother always listened sympathetically to my dreams of a career. Then she taught me another recipe. By the way, I asked Lydecker to come here. Did you tell him I'm... I'm all right? No. Why not? It's brutal. I'm not doing it for fun, Miss Hunt. Why did you break your word and go out to see Shelby last night? Diane Redfern was in love with him. You admitted that. I also told you that he wasn't in love with her. Sit still. I'll open it. Uh, what are you doing here, Carpenter? Hello, McPherson. How are you, my darling? Hello, dear. Well, it's on again, huh? Do I have to get a permit from the police department to kiss my fiancée good morning? So he made you change your mind. Um, speaking of changing one's mind, McPherson, I've just come from my lawyer. Yeah? Did he tell you how much you'd get off for good behavior? He told me that anything I may have said last night was said under duress and can't be used against me. Besides, none of it was true. Smart lawyer you got, Carpenter. Maybe he told you how that scotch got in here Friday night after you bought it at Moscone's. Maybe it was the lawyer who brought Diane Redfern up here. Maybe the... Hello, Lydecker. Well, McPherson, have you thought over the deal I suggested? I think... Walter. Laura. La... Oh. Waldo. Keeled right over, uh, didn't he? Waldo, uh, it's all right, darling. <laughs> There's oh, been a mistake. I'm alive and well. Uh, Want a doctor, Lydecker? No, no, I... I oh, don't I... say anything, oh, dear. dear me. Uh, Just be quiet. Uh, uh, Laura Hunt wasn't killed, Lydecker. It was Diane Redfern. Di... 
Perhaps oh. by mistake. Do you understand that? Oh. Perhaps by mistake. Oh, dear. Oh. Poor darling. Oh, dear. Don't tell me you're in love with him, too. Now, look here, McPherson. You're not to talk that way to Miss Hunt. Sit down and shut up, Carpenter. I've got enough on you to arrest you right now. Uh, quick, McPherson, the handcuffs. Trundle him off to the hooskow. You keep out of this, Waldo. But you look nice in bracelets, Shelby. Why don't you get down on all fours again, Lydica? It's the only time you've ever kept your mouth shut. Laura, darling, you must forgive me. The wee touch of the vapors. It's an old family custom. But welcome, wench. And tell us how it feels to return from the great beyond. Please, Waldo, don't. No, I'm sorry, my dear. Well, McPherson, what does Laura's resurrection do to you? Too bad Diane Redfern can't be resurrected. I'm afraid I've interrupted what you gentlemen call a pinch. Do your duty, McPherson. You know, Lydecker, you've made me change my mind for the moment. Well, then that gives us time for a little get-together. You better order some champagne, Laura, lots of it. What for? I'm going to invite your friends to celebrate your return. Oh, why, Waldo? A sense of the fitness of things. Maybe our friends can weave all the loose ends into a noose. Eh, McPherson? Don't bother, Lydecker. I've already phoned the guests myself. Nice party, Miss Hunt. I can't say that I approve of it. Laura. You having a good time, Carpenter? If you don't mind, McPherson, I'd like a word with Miss Hunt. Why, I don't mind. Talk to her as much as you like. I'll see you later. I see he's taken a new tack, Laura. What do you mean? Trying to make you like him. To make you talk. Shelby, why did you go out to the cottage last night? Don't you know? I was afraid you wouldn't think of hiding that shotgun. What shotgun? The one I gave you. You don't have to lie to me, darling. I'll stick to you. You... You think that I shot... Oh. Excuse me, Shelby. I, I don't want to talk about this any longer. But, Laura... I can't stand this deception. It's uncertainty. Suspicion. But, Laura, wait! I... Laura! What's the matter? Oh, uh, I'm just nervous, I guess, Anne. So am I. I think McPherson suspects Shelby. He seems to suspect me, too. So do some of my friends. You? Don't be absurd. You couldn't ever do a thing like that. And Shelby? I don't think he did it. But he's capable of it. Laura, are you as interested in McPherson as he is in you? Well, I, I only met him last night. And that's more than long enough sometimes. At any rate, he's better for you than Shelby. Anybody is. Shelby's better for me. Why, Anne? Because I can afford him. I understand him. He's no good, but he's what I want. And I'm not a nice person, Laura. Neither is he. He knows I know he's a heel. He also knows I don't care. We belong together because we're both weak and can't seem to help it. That's why I know he's capable of murder. He's like me. Anne. No, dear. I didn't do it. But I thought of it. Oh, Waldo. Go over here and talk to Laura. What's the matter? She says she's nervous. You know how to handle her, Waldo. Take over. Waldo. They found a shotgun at my cottage. Well, what of it, my dear? Don't look so desperate, darling. But Shelby thinks I did it. Shelby never thinks. He merely twitches. You better come back now, Laura. Your guests are looking for you. But don't let Shelby upset you and don't talk to McPherson so much. And I'm not afraid of Mark. Mark? When was this innocent trust born? Don't let him fool you, my dear. The man has a twisted mind. Quiet, Waldo. Here he comes. I don't care. I'll say it to his face. He could be madly in love with you and still try to send you to the chair. Yes, he's right, Laura. I don't always like my job. I don't care whether you're guilty or not, Laura. I won't even ask you. I don't want to know. Hello? Just a moment. For you, Lieutenant, the Homicide Bureau calling. Oh, yes. McPherson? Yeah, I know. Now, don't worry, Inspector. I told you I'd bring in the killer this afternoon. Killer? Do you think he really knows who did it? Yeah. I was just going to make the arrest when you called. No, I can't tell you now. I'm not alone. You'll see when I come in. Right. 
See you later. Okay, Miss Hunt. Let's you go down to headquarters. Oh, yeah. Don't worry, darling. Let them accuse you. We'll fight them. I have every weapon. Money, connections, prestige, and my column. Every day, 80 syndicated columns will be devoted to your defense. Millions will read about you and rally behind you. You talk as if you wanted to see her tried for murder. Yes, yes, indeed. Rather than let you blacken her name with suspicions and rumors. Laura, I told you to watch out for that fellow. Yes, I know, Shelby. Can we go now, Lieutenant McPherson? It's too bad you didn't open that door last Friday night and get it, Carpenter. Why, you insufferable! Shelby! Is that your best punch, Shelby? Try this for size! All right, Miss Hunt, come on. As Mark McPherson floors Shelby Carpenter with a neat right cross to the jaw and with hand firmly on Laura's shoulder exits through the door upstage center, there approaches from downstage right a familiar and purposeful figure. He is Kenneth Banghart with more news about the new Ford. One of the most important news items about the 49 Ford is that it's been designed for even greater economy of operation, built to give you new savings on gas. There'll be a choice of two new Ford engines, a 95-horsepower 6 and a 100-horsepower V8. Both were created to give you outstanding new performances as well as new economy. The 49 Ford can be described as a living room on wheels. It will have seats wide enough for three big people to sit in comfort. The front seat will be 57 inches wide, and the rear seat will be a full five feet. There'll be plenty of room overhead and underfoot. There will be picture window visibility with 20 square feet of windows. There'll be plenty of baggage space with the new Ford deep deck luggage locker, more than half again as much storage space. As an accessory, you may have Ford's new magic air temperature control. You'll be able to regulate the climate in your car the year round. And all of this will be enclosed in Ford's new lifeguard body for extra safety. Beneath it will be Ford's new drop center frame with a new low center of gravity... New hydrocoil springs in front and new paraflex springs in the rear. New magic action king-size brakes for a quick, sure stop. And the smooth new midship ride. It all adds up to the living room on wheels, which will be the new 49 Ford. As for the exterior, the style and design of the new Ford 49er, that is still a secret. But I can tell you that it was designed to be a dream car. The car of the year. Before long, however, you'll see it for yourself. In June, you will see the car of the year, the 49 Ford. As the curtain rises on the final act of the Ford Theater's presentation of Laura, we return very briefly to Lieutenant Mark McPherson and the report of his investigation. I must report here that for personal reasons, I did not book the suspect on any charge. Instead, I took her directly to the examination room at headquarters and grilled her myself. I directed Miss Hunt to be seated in the prisoner's chair. I turned on the two lamps. Their harsh glare slapped across her face. Must I... must I be blinded by that? Yes. All right, now let's have it. Look at me. What are you trying to do? Force a confession out of me? You've been holding out, and I want to know why. It'll go a lot easier if you tell the truth. What difference does it make what I say? You've already made up your mind I'm guilty. Are you? Don't tell me you have any doubts, since you... Oh, I... I can't. Please. Please, do I... Do I have to have the lights in my face? Thank you. No, I didn't kill Diane Redfern. Or anyone else. Why did you tell me the radio in your country place was broken? Because it was. Not when I tried it. 
Just as I was leaving the village, I asked the local handyman to fix it. How'd he get in? I always leave a key under the flower pot on the porch. Well, you're too intelligent to make up something I could check so easily, but you're intelligent enough to have broken the radio yourself to strengthen your story. The main thing I want to know is why you pulled the switch on me about Shelby. You told me last night you decided not to marry him. Yes, I... guess I did. But today it was on again. Why? Well, I... changed my mind. What are you trying to hide? Don't you realize you're involved in a murder? Now, what went on between you and Shelby when you saw him last night? Did he persuade you to make up, or did you agree to pretend you had? Was that it? Well, we... that is... both of us thought He convinced that... you that if you broke the engagement now, people would think you believed he was guilty? Yes. But now I know it was only because... because he thought I was. Did you believe he was guilty? No, I'm sure he isn't. Are you in love with him? I don't see how I ever could have been. Come on, Laura. You're going home. But I thought I That's was... That's what I wanted you to think. You and a few others. I didn't even book you. You mean this was sort of a... a game? No, no. I was 99% certain of you, but I had to get rid of that 1% doubt. Oh. And I did. Wasn't there an easier way to make sure... Well, I'd reached the point where I needed official surroundings, Laura. Then it was worth it, Mark. Officially, I was relieved that I could clear Miss Hunt. Privately, I was delighted that my last suspicions of Laura were gone. During the earlier part of that evening, I was happier than I'd been since I'd taken over the case. I put Laura into a cab and then went over to Lydecker's apartment. He wasn't home, so I let myself in and had a look around. The only thing that caught my attention was the grandfather's clock. It was identical to the one in Laura's apartment. I stood there and tried to figure it out. It was tall and inlaid with rare, beautiful woods. And bit by bit, I began to notice that there were trick drawers and hidden compartments behind the woodworking. I began to go over the clock carefully, tapping its front and sides every few inches. Finally, I located a hollow panel about six inches wide and four feet high. I knew I was getting hot, but I couldn't find a way to make the door to that secret compartment open. I knew I was on the right track. I worked on it for an hour, and at last, in desperation, I kicked it open. The gleam of triumph in my eye must have faded. The compartment was empty. From there, I started for Laura's apartment where she and Lydecker were spending the evening. It still doesn't make sense to me. McPherson's playing some sort of game with you, Laura. I don't think so. I don't deny he's infatuated with you in some warped way of his own. But he isn't capable of any normal, warm human relationship. He's been dealing with criminals too long. When you were unattainable, when he thought you were dead, that's what he wanted you most. But he was glad when I came back. Almost as if he were... Were waiting for me. Do you know what he calls women? Dames. A dame in Washington Heights got a fox fur out of him. His very word. Oh, that doesn't mean anything, Waldo. He isn't like that. Lord, dear, you have one tragic weakness. With you, a lean, strong body is the measure of a man. And you always get hurt. No man is ever going to hurt me again. No one. Not even you. I hurt you? Laura, Laura, look at me. When a man has everything in the world he wants, except what he wants most, he loses his uh, self-respect. It makes him bitter, Laura. He wants to hurt someone as he's been hurt. You were a long time finding out about Shelby. But now that's over. We'll be together again. Hello, Laura. Good evening, Lydecker. Hello, Ma. Haven't you heard of science's newest triumph, the doorbell? I don't like to remind her. It was the murderer's signal. Did you eavesdrop, too, I hope? Laura, I thought you'd like to know. We tested your shotgun. It isn't the one. Now, that's what I call a typical move, a real key to the man's character. First, he tells you he knows you're innocent, and then he proceeds to check up on you. When I report I think she's innocent, that's a personal opinion. When I submit proof... It becomes the opinion of the whole department. Laura, this entire maneuver could be a trick to get you off your guard. It could be, Lydecker, but it isn't. I believe you, Mark. It's the same obvious pattern, Laura. If McPherson wasn't muscular and handsome in a cheap sort of way, 
You would understand him. See through him in a second. Waldo, I... I mean to be as kind about this as I know how, but I, I must tell you, you're the one who always follows the same obvious pattern. You, you've mocked and ridiculed every hope of love I've ever had. You hate men who like me. You, you find their weaknesses and humiliate them in front of me. First it was Jacoby and then Shelby and now... Laura, Laura, I... I don't, I don't think we should ever see each other again. But you, 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 you're not yourself, darling. Yes, I... I am. For the first time in ages, I know what I'm doing. Yes. Yes. Very well. My congratulations, McPherson. Laura... I hope you'll be very happy in Brooklyn, wearing a fox fur and shopping for parlor suites in the credit establishments, and never regret what promises to be a disgustingly earthy relationship. Good evening. That was the most difficult thing I've ever had to do in all my life. Never mind about Waldo. That clock, the one he gave you. Laura, do you mind if I bust it up a little? What are you doing? If I'm wrong, the department will pay to have this fixed. But I'm not wrong. Look for yourself. A shotgun? Ever see this before? No. That's why Waldo was so anxious to get the clock moved out of here. Now, let's see. The doorbell rang. Diane Redfern came to the door in your negligee. She opened the door. The room was dark. Waldo saw a girl and assumed it was you. No. If he couldn't have you, he was going to make sure no one else could. So he shot her right in the face with both barrels. Oh. She fell here. Waldo heard Shelby running in from the next room, so he hid in the stairway outside. Shelby was so scared, he ran out as fast as he could. Then Waldo came back and placed the gun in the clock. I knew it. I felt it ever since I came home. But I didn't want to believe it. I, I couldn't make myself believe that... that Waldo... Waldo was a, a murderer. Well, he is. I was afraid you thought it was Shelby. I knew Shelby wasn't guilty. He hasn't the courage to kill a fly. But Waldo was doing everything to incriminate him. It was just his way of getting rid of Shelby, as he did Jacoby. Well, I must say, for a charming, intelligent girl, you've certainly surrounded yourself with a remarkable collection of dopes. All except one. Mark. Don't touch the clock and leave the gun where it is. Fingerprints will be important. I'll have it picked up tomorrow. What are you going to do? Arrest Waldo. Mark. It can't be helped. If the doorbell rings, don't answer it. I'll phone you in the morning. Good night, Mark. You'll get some sleep. You gotta forget this whole thing. Like a bad dream. Evening, Schultz. Evening, Lieutenant. Hi, McAverty. Hi. Sorry to keep you boys hanging around in front of the house here all night, but I had... Everything to... okay inside, Lieutenant? Yeah, I... Who's tailing Leidecker? I was going to when he came out. But he left five minutes ago, McAverty. I'm telling you, he didn't come out, Lieutenant. Well, that... Hey, he hasn't left the building. Well, where is he? Now, let me think, Schultz. Let's see. Went out the front door, walked into the hall, and instead of going down the stairs... Yeah? There's a back door to Laura's apartment. Bessie used it to come in the first morning I went there. It was open then. If it's open now. The three of us bolted up the steps. I started for the front door, Sergeants McAvity and Schultz for the back door. By then, though, Lydecker had let himself into the flat. A new and tragic transformation had come over him. His eyes burned slowly with a murderous, maniacal gleam. His thin lips were set cruelly, and his grip on his walking stick tightened so that his muscles quivered. He must have stood there for a moment as the mood to murder grew upon him. And then, turning deliberately, he walked to the clock, reached in, took out the shotgun. Slowly, Lydecker drew two shells from his pocket and slipped them into the gun. Then he closed it. Laura heard the sound from her bedroom. Who? Who is it? Mark. Mark, have you come back for... Waldo. <laughs> Waldo, you've taken one life. Isn't that enough? Laura, darling. Put down that gun. The best part of myself, that's what you are. 
Do you think I'm going to leave it to the vulgar pawing of a second-rate detective who thinks you're a day? Oh, don't you! Do you think I can bear the thought of him holding you in his arms, kissing you, loving you? No, Laura, not in a million years. Laura, Laura, open the door. Don't move. There he is now. He shall find us together, Laura, as we always have been, as we always will be. Oh, oh! Behind me, Laura. All right, Lieutenant. You'll die, too. In here, McCavity. No, you don't. Light a curtain. Oh, no, don't shoot. That's it. As close as I ever want it. You all right, Laura? Yes, Mark. Want me to call an ambulance for him, Lieutenant? Too late now. Waldo, you're... Yes, yes, I... I'm dying. Clumsy of me, isn't it? Rather fitting. Murder has always been my favorite crime. Thank you for everything, my dear. Goodbye. In conclusion, I wish to commend Sergeant Thomas McAvity for quick action and excellent marksmanship. Credit for the shooting of Leidecker must be given to him. Triplicate copies of this report will be filed with the Chief Inspector's Office, the Commissioner's Office, and the Office of the District Attorney. As far as this Bureau is concerned, the record is closed. Witness at my hand, here and under, Mark McPherson, Lieutenant, Homicide Bureau, Police Department, New York City. Dear... Yes, Laura. Aren't you forgetting something? Oh, yeah. Special request to the chief of the bureau is hereby made by Lieutenant McPherson. Subject, a three-week leave of absence beginning as of this date. Purpose, honeymoon with Mrs. McPherson. Curtain has descended here on the stage of the Ford Theater. It has brought to a close today's presentation of Laura, which featured Virginia Gilmore in the title role. I would like, too, to acknowledge the excellent performance of John Larkin in the part of Lieutenant Mark McPherson and Ivor Francis as Waldo Lidecker. Next Sunday afternoon, I shall be in Detroit, sitting by a radio and listening to the Ford Theater for the first time as a member of the air audience. It so happens that Detroit is not only the home of the Ford Motor Company and the hub of the automobile industry, it is also a wonderful city in which to launch a new play. In Detroit, I shall join my colleague, Russell Krauss, for the hectic days which will precede the birth of our latest theatrical venture, Life with Mother. During my three weeks' absence from the Ford Theater, my place will be taken by three very eminent men of the theater, Alfred Drake... Eddie Dowling, and Louis Calhern. Next week, Alfred Drake, star of the current Broadway hit, Joy to the World, will preside over the Ford Theater's presentation of Michael and Mary. I shall be listening, and I hope you will, too. Laura was written by Vera Caspary and adapted for radio by Howard Teichman. The music, based on the original score by David Raxon, was adapted and conducted by Lynn Murray, and the entire production was under the direction of George Zachary. Other players heard today were Betty Gard, Alan Hewitt, Charles Mendick, Charles Penman, and Anne Seymour. Laura was presented through the courtesy of 20th Century Fox, producers of the motion picture The Iron Curtain, starring Gene Tierney and Dana Andrews. Next week, meet Michael and Mary. The Ford Theater is presented by the Ford Motor Company, makers of Ford, Mercury, and Lincoln cars, 
and Ford trucks, farm tractors, and industrial engines. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.